Welcome to the Jewish Book Festival, um, our 25th anniversary Jewish Book Festival. And I'd like to thank you for joining us. Um, this festival is sponsored by the Jewish Federations of the Greater San Gabriel and Pomona Valleys. Um, it takes a, tra a great amount of effort and commitment to create this festival. So before we get started, I'd like to thank our dedicated committee members, our advanced readers, the Federation staff and our coordinator, Rebecca Russell, the Jewish Book Council in New York, our behind the scenes tech wizard, Jake Tavel, and our literary circle members whose financial support make all this event possible. I'm Deborah Noble, your host for this event with Barbara Levinson. As our Jewish Book Festival celebrates its 25th year, our Jewish Federation is also celebrating a milestone, 30 years of bringing our community together with programs like our Jewish Book Festival, the PJ Library, the Cultural uh, Arts Program, and more, while also serving as the Jewish voice of our community. To mark this achievement, the Federation has planned a number of programs in celebration of the 30th anniversary, including a special 30th anniversary brunch on Sunday, June 23rd, where we will be honoring our past presidents, saluting our first 30 years and looking forward to our next 30. This evening's program will feature Oren Kessler presenting Palestine 1936, the Great Revolt and the Roots of the Middle East Conflict, followed by a Q&A. If you'd like to ask Oren a question, uh, please type it into the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. The chat will be closed. And now it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's author, Oren Kessler. Raised in Rochester, New York, and Tel Aviv, Oren is a journalist and political analyst based in Tel Aviv. He studied history at the University of Toronto and earned his master's in diplomacy and conflict studies from Reichman University in Herzliya. He served as a deputy director for research at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies in Washington, D.C., and as a research fellow at the Henry Jackson Society in London. On the journalistic side, he has been an Arab affairs correspondent for uh, the Jerusalem Post and an editor and translator for Haaretz English edition. His articles have appeared in Foreign Policy, The Wall Street Journal, The Washington Post, and Politico, and Palestine 1936 is his first book. Welcome, Oren. Well, thank you very much, Debbie. Uh, thank you to uh, Rebecca Russell and Barbara Levinson. Thank you to the uh, S SGPV, I had to practice that, uh, Jewish Book Festival and the Jewish Federation and the Jewish Book Council. I really uh, appreciate the opportunity to talk with you all this evening. Um, let me set my timer here to make sure I don't run over. So when we, uh, when we first scheduled this event months ago, of course, the plan was for me to talk to you all about my, my book, Palestine 1936. And I will certainly uh, speak about that book this evening. I'm very proud of it. It took me five years to write and to research, and I hope, I hope you all read it. Um, but I think since uh, October 7th, I've felt that it simply wouldn't be right for me to not speak to, uh, to you about what has happened and what is happening. I don't think it would be right uh, to you on, on the other end. I don't think it would feel right to me, given how consumed I've been emotionally, personally, intellectually, and in every other way uh, with what has happened. So I'm going to, I think, start by talking a bit about how I personally experienced that uh, very dark day as someone who, who does live in Tel Aviv uh, and as someone who has covered Arab-Israeli issues and issues of terrorism um, for years now. Uh, so I think I'll start with that, that sort of personal connection and then zoom out to a more sort of analytical lens and then, and then, um, and then finally bring my book in for a bit of historical context in terms of how we got here. Uh, so October 7th, 2023 was my wedding day. Uh, my partner and I, my, my better half, uh, Clara, and I had come from Tel Aviv to New York in late September to iron out all the details. We had planned to have a very intimate 
uh, wedding in Central Park in New York with our immediate families, a rabbi and a photographer. And the, the night before, or a few days before the wedding, my, um, my wife, excuse me, who's quite old school in many ways, told me, she's like, look, we're, we're not, the night before the wedding, uh, we're not sleeping in the same bed or the same room. You, you can be in, the, in, our, in our hotel, in our uh, newlywed suite, and I'll be with my family at an Airbnb in New Jersey. So I woke up uh, October 7th alone in my hotel room in Midtown Manhattan, and I, and, and I was woken up by a call on my, on my cell phone. And it was 8 a.m. exactly, and I noticed that the call was coming in from India. And I thought, that's odd. You know, I had done a few media hits in India over the years, but it seemed a strange time to be calling. Uh, and so at this point, I had my phone in my hand. And of course, uh, I started to see the alerts. And I see that 40 Israelis have been killed in a Hamas attack. And I said out loud, what the bleep? 40 Israelis? How on earth did this happen? I'm sure many of you may remember during the second intifada, there was a, a horrific attack uh, also on a Jewish holiday on Passover uh, in Netanya, the Park Hotel massacre. It was an awful day. Um, it still, it, it, it led to a very forceful IDF response in Operation Defensive Shield. And it's still a day that we talk about very often in Israel. Well, in that massacre, 30 people were killed. And now I'm getting an alert in 2023 that 40 people have been killed. And I'm thinking, what on earth has happened? was was did, did Hamas rockets land at a, at a soccer game and just everyone was fully exposed and 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 so I'm reading the articles and I'm still not quite understanding what's happened and mind you this is 8 9 a.m uh New York time so this is eight or nine hours after this attack began and I'm simply not understanding how these people were killed rockets bullets what happened and finally I go on Twitter and I press the images uh, button and that's when I began to understand what happened because I saw images of seven bodies lying face down uh, at a bus stop in Sterot lying in their own blood I saw images of young people at a music festival in the desert running for their for their lives as shots rang out behind them and I saw a video of one of those festival goers a young woman who I now know is named Noah Algamani, being forcibly placed on a on a motorcycle by bearded men in bandanas as she desperately calls out to her boyfriend who's also being taken away. And even worse things I saw that day, that morning. Um, and um, and so, you know, over the next half hour, hour, the death toll rose a hundred. 150. And of course, I was very torn about whether to go through the wedding. But at a certain point, I got a, uh, a text message from my friend, Nathaniel in Tel Aviv, like me, he's an American guy who, who made Aliyah lives in Tel Aviv. And he said, he said, don't let anything interrupt your simcha. And I thought, Okay, he's right. So we went through with it. And it was a lovely wedding, uh, despite everything. It was very, very intimate, very meaningful. We had a lovely, fancy dinner afterwards. We went back to the Omni Hotel in Midtown Manhattan, and um, we weren't exactly in celebratory mood, but we, we caught up on the news, tried to digest it, and we went to sleep. Uh, the next morning, my dad called me. Um, my dad, both of my parents are, are Israeli. My dad is a physicist. He's a scientist. I've never seen him cry in, in my life. But I heard him on the other end and he and he said, uh, have you talked to anyone in Israel? And I said, yeah, my cousin, uh, Amir, my cousin called, um, probably, you know, I figured he just wanted to let to kind of update me on what was happening, probably to say Mazal Tov. And I can hear my dad's voice uh, cracking and he, he only says one word. He says, Tomer, Tomer. Um, Tomer was, is, is the, the son of my cousin Michal. We're a very small family. I only have three cousins in the world, two of whom live in Israel. And Tomer, I knew, was a platoon commander um, of a, an elite infantry unit, the Nachal uh, Reconnaissance Unit. And he tells me, uh, 
Tomer neherag in Hebrew. Tomer was killed. Um, and so I just want to talk a bit about Tomer and about his family uh, before before I move on. I think um, I think almost everyone, every Israeli, everyone living in Israel has has a connection to what happened, and this this happens to be to be mine. Uh, Tomer was twenty three years old. He, um, in fact, I'll pull up a photo of him if I may. Okay, here we go. Share. That's Tomo. He, um, as you can perhaps tell by the photo, he well, he was he was a lovely a lovely guy. He was an extremely sweet person, and I know we say that uh, about everyone. When anytime anyone dies, we always, of course, say that the, the nicest things about them in our eulogies. But he was a truly he was a truly lovely person. My Clara, my wife, and I. Every time we met him, we were so just taken aback by how genuine, how warm he was. He was always sort of smiling and laughing. He always had this expression on his face as if he was in on a joke that 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 you weren't. Um, and he always, uh, Tomer always wanted to be a warrior. Um, I should say that he he uh, he comes from a family. His 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 parents are very much peaceniks in the old Israeli they they uh they were at the protests every week against the judicial overhaul uh his um his father ran um was uh actually for years would they live in the south of israel and he would volunteer to pick sick kids up at the border with gaza take them to hospital in israel and then bring them back um but tomer always wanted to be a warrior he was not a militaristic person he didn't talk much about politics but he always wanted to defend the country, to defend his his friends and family. And, um, you know, I think we can take a little bit of solace knowing that he um, he died doing what he wanted to do, which was to defend to defend uh, the country, to defend his family. He died uh, battling terrorists and keeping the kibbutz that they were guarding safe and no civilians were killed. This was at the they were um, deployed to Kerem Shalom kibbutz right on the right on the corner, right next to Gaza, and no civilians were killed there. No one was abducted there, um, but Tomer paid with his life. And it took five days for him to be buried because the resources of the army and the government were so, had been so stretched even to this day. We're now, what, three and a half weeks out and still there are funerals happening all the time. They didn't have enough people uh, to bury the dead, to carry the casket. Um, and so I want to talk uh, a little bit on that rather grim segue about about uh, body counts, about death tolls. And I promise my entire presentation will not be dark and depressing. I will I will bring some rays of light in uh, uh, in a little bit. But I think it's important that we look head on at the situation, at, at, at what has happened uh, to the state of Israel and um, and 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 uh, to confront it directly. So if we look, I'm sure you've heard that this was the, the bloodiest day for, for Jews since the Holocaust, and it, and it was, of course. Um, and it was far and away the bloodiest, deadliest day in Israeli history. If you look at the second bloodiest day, you know, as we know, on October 7th, 1,400 people, some 1,400 Israelis were killed. If we look at the second bloodiest day in Israeli history, it's about 300 people. That was the first day of the Yom Kippur War. And those 300 were all, every one of them, soldiers. On October 7th, they were overwhelmingly uh, civilians. And as we know, they were elderly people. They were women. They were children. They were babies. And I don't need to recount the way that many of them were killed, because you all know by now. If we look at the Second Intifada, let's look at the worst day of the Second Intifada. 122, 122 people were killed on the worst day of the Second Intifada. Well, now this was more than 10 times that in a single day. In fact, more people were killed on 10-7 than in the entire Intifada combined. So this was an Intifada of three or five years, depending on how you count. An awful time in Israeli history, a very traumatic time, and yet more Israelis were killed on one single day this month. The hostages is almost an entirely new element. Of course, Israel has had captives taken before, 
I'm sure many of you remember the Gilad Shalit saga. Gilad Shalit was taken by Hamas in 2006. Uh, he was a soldier. Uh, he was eventually exchanged in a prisoner exchange five years later for one for 1,100 uh, Palestinians convicted of terrorism. So how on earth, when there are 240 hostages in Gaza, will we, namely Israel, how will Israel get them out? By freeing 200,000 uh, terrorists? I re that, that's, a, that's a subject for another lecture because I simply don't have the answer for it. So... You know, when I, I, I tweeted the other day that when I when I think about what's happened, I there's one word that that resonates in my head over and over that echoes in my head and it's nightmare. Nightmare. You know, I, I don't see how this could have gone worse. I don't think there was a page in the IDF playbook for something like this happening. Sure, there was a scenario in which Hamas breaches the border, maybe even manages to kill a few people before they're eliminated. But to run riot for hours and hours and hours, to take 240 hostages, to kill unthinkable numbers of Israelis, I don't think any such scenario was ever raised, was ever floated in IDF planning rooms. So I promised uh, some rays of hope, and, and here goes. I think since October 7th, we've seen the most beautiful side of Israel. I think we've seen Israel Hayafa beautiful Israel. There's a, there's a phrase in Hebrew that some of you may know, which is Kol Israel arevim all of Israel is responsible for one another. And I really think we've, we've seen that. We've seen a tremendous burst of unity and, and solidarity. We've seen, at the, I, I don't want to get too political here, but, but we've seen a government that has not really risen to the challenges. Um, arguably before, during, or after this horrific onslaught. And in the, in the vacuum that the government has left, we've seen this massive grassroots effort. We've seen 15,000 people in Tel Aviv alone collecting clothing, collecting toys for kids who have lost their homes. We've seen restaurants divert their entire, uh, their entire staff to just making food for soldiers. We've seen people uh, finding homes in huge numbers for people who have lost their homes or have been evacuated for their own safety. Uh, and let's not forget where the country was before this all happened. The country was riven by this uh, judicial overhaul push. It, there, was a, there was a level of, of ugliness and, and rancor within among Israelis uh, between proponents and opponents of this judicial overhaul uh, that was simply staggering. and. To now see the country coming together in this way, I think, is is really quite inspiring. And that's actually, I think, a good segue into my book. My book is about the first Palestinian Arab Intifada from 1936, excuse me, to 1939. And the of course, it was it was this was an Arab revolt. This was the great Arab revolt against Zionism and against uh, the British Empire that was in the Arab view, facilitating Zionism. But, and, and, but although the revolt was Arab, I, I argue in my book that the, the Jewish counter-revolt is a crucial and forgotten chapter in the story of how most of Mandate Palestine became the state of Israel. And I, and I argue that from a Jewish perspective, the, the, the Jewish Zionist leadership of the time, led by David Ben-Gurion, even in this early stage, he was already the clear leader of the, the Jews of pre-state uh, mandate Palestine. The, the Zionist leadership was expert at turning adversity into, into advantage. Excuse me, I'm going to take a, a sip of water here. And I'll explain what I mean by, uh, in a moment by turning adversity into advantage, but I want to talk just a little bit about how this revolt started. You know, often when I start telling people about my book, they say, oh, uh, you mean Hebron, uh, na the Hebron massacre? And, and the answer is no. The Hebron massacre was a very grim and gruesome uh, couple of days in Hebron and a few other places in 1929 in which 133 Jews were killed in very gruesome ways that in many ways uh, recall what we saw on 10-7. But I argue that that's all that they were. These were this was terrorism. This were, these were riots. But it was not a sustained nationalist uprising. 
the first time we saw anything like that, a, you know, a true intifada in the parlance of today was uh, 1936. Um, and so it, really, to, in order to sort of understand the backdrop to this revolt, you have to look at uh, demographics, at the demographic backdrop. I think the Middle East conflict is so complicated in so many ways, but certain things are really quite stark and simple. And one of them is demographics, then and now. That the ultimate question in many ways is who has the majority? Who has 51%? And so in this period uh, that I'm, that, that's the core of my book, in the first, um, so Adolf Hitler comes to power in Germany in January 1933, as we know. And this is really uh, the crucial backdrop to the story of my book, the rise of Hitler, the rise of other anti-Semitic movements in Europe, in Hungary, Romania, Poland, because the, um, I'm not going to get too much into the Balfour Declaration, the start of the mandate. I think many of you already know a little bit about that early history, but in the first half of the 1930s, the Jewish population of Mandate Palestine of the land of Israel doubles again, uh, spurred on by this just outburst of anti-Semitism uh, in Europe. So, um, so in 1935, 60,000 Jews come to the country, and that was twice as much as had come the year before. And for the Arabs of Palestine, not just for the more educated intelligentsia of, of the cities, but even the uh, often illiterate subsistence farmers in the countryside were per perceptive enough to recognize that if things went on this way, the Jews would be a majority before long. And so there was a man uh, in 1935 by the name of uh, a name who's who's uh, which may be known, may be recognized by many of you, and that's Is Adin Al Qassam, who of course has lent his name to the armed wing, the terror wing of Hamas that committed the 10/7 atrocities. So Qassam was a, a preacher. He was originally from Syria. He came down to Palestine. Uh, in 1920, because he was wanted by the French Mandate authorities up in Syria. And he uh, was preaching at a mosque in Haifa. It's still there, this mosque, you can go visit it. Uh, but he was preaching jihad. He was, a, he was uh, a, 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 a jihadist before perhaps the term was even known. And he was preaching things to the urban Muslim poor of Haifa, which at the time was a mixed but still majority Arab city. And he was preaching things like, you know, when the British officer uh, produces his boot for you to shine, don't, don't take out your uh, brush, take out your pistol, that sort of thing. And his acolytes waged a few sporadic attacks against Jews and against uh, British, some of which were fatal. And at a certain point, they killed a Jewish policeman by the name of Moshe Rosenfeld, uh, who was known as the best horseman in Palestine, incidentally. Uh, but this was a huge mistake because they were now wanted by the British authorities. They had killed a member of His Majesty's police. And so, uh, long story short, a manhunt ensues. Qassam is killed by the British in the forests of what we now call the West Bank. And he really becomes the first uh, martyr icon in the Palestinian Arab pantheon. He's the kind of the proto-martyr. And Ben-Gurion uh, recognizes the significance of this event immediately. And he writes in his diary, Finally, the Arabs have found someone who's willing to die for an ideal. And he predicted that hundreds and thousands more would follow in his footsteps. And indeed, a few months later, some of Qassam's followers ambushed uh, a Jewish poultry merchant right, uh, plying his trade on the road between Nablus and Tulkarim. They ambushed uh, this car, killed two Jews. And this is often considered the, the opening shots of the Arab revolt. Um, and really, so the revolt begins in violence, but very soon uh, there are political demands that are placed on top. The kind of political leadership rushes to assert control over, uh, over this revolt. And there's another name that will be known to many of you, and that's Haj Amin al Husseini. He's the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, the notorious Grand Mufti, who would become infamous uh, a decade later for allying with Adolf Hitler during the Second World War. But the Mufti announces that uh, the revolt will continue and that a, a complete Arab boycott would continue. This has some resonance to today um, uh, because the Arabs boycotted the Jewish and British economies completely. 
Um, they ended up doing so for six months, which is actually one of the longest general strikes of all time. So the Mufti announces that the, the revolt and the strike will continue unless some major demands are met. Chief among them, a complete stop, a complete cessation of Jewish immigration and a complete ban on land sales because very many prominent and wealthy Arabs were selling land to Jews at quite inflated uh, prices, even while they railed against the practice in public. Uh, and so this this revolt, this first phase of the revolt lasts uh, six months and it, it bears fruit because the British send over a royal uh, commission acting in the name of the king. This is actually uh, the very short lived short, so, sorry, short reigned King Edward the seventh, I believe, who uh, the seventh, who shortly thereafter would uh, famously abdicate to marry an American divorcee. But this commission comes over to Palestine, spends several months there. This is known to history as the Peel Commission, and they produce a uh, 400 page report, which, uh, you know, if anyone has the, the entire month of November free, I strongly suggest they read because it's uh, it's very well written. It's very illuminating, but it's it's mostly known to history uh, for its last 10 or 15 pages in which uh, the commissioners recommend the partition of Palestine. This is the uh, very first two state solution, if you like. This is in 1937. This is the first time that a notion of a Jewish state appears on the international agenda. So not uh, not merely a national home, as promised by the Balfour Declaration, not a canton or an autonomous zone, but a state with everything that that means. That means borders, that means uh, an army, that means control over immigration. Uh, and, um, and so uh, I won't give uh, too much more away about what actually happens in my book, because then none of you will, will read it. But uh, I do want to get back to this idea of uh, turning adversity into advantage. I just mentioned the, uh, the Peel Commission, the Peel Partition Plan. Again, this is a direct result of the revolt, right? This, was, this wouldn't have happened if not for the revolt. Because of the revolt, um, uh, this, this notion of a Jewish state reaches the top of the, 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 the agenda of the, the imperial power that's uh, that's that's uh, with the most clout over the most control over over Palestine. Ben Gurion actually writes in his diary something like, uh, "We have to thank the Mufti for uh, for this revolt." Uh, you know, he doesn't know what a what a fantastic service he's done for us. Uh, so that's just in terms of political uh, ambitions. Militarily, this is a hugely formative period for uh, the Zionist movement. This is the period in which the seeds of the Jewish army are really sown. This is the period in which the uh, the Haganah, which is the mainstream Jewish self-defense group, uh, the self-defense organization, goes from being a, a network of you know, glorified night watchmen uh, from that to really the seed of a Jewish army. And it all happens through the uh, good offices of the preeminent military power of the time, namely the British Empire, because the British realize after a certain point that they're unable to wrestle uh, this revolt to the ground. They simply don't have the manpower to do so. This is um, this is already 1936, 37, 38. The war clouds are gathering above Europe, and it seems to be a question, excuse me, of when and not if war with Hitler uh, is going to erupt. And so what, what do they do? They uh, agree to a long-standing Jewish Zionist plea to arm and train Jews in large numbers. So they create something called uh, the Jewish supernumerary police, which in Hebrew is known as the Notrim. And uh, through this framework, some 15 to 20,000 Jews are again armed and trained and often paid by the British. But it's clear to everyone that they are, in fact, answerable to the Haganah. This is also the period of another uh, name, which may be familiar to many of you, and that's Ord Wingate. Wingate was a, a British officer. Um, he was extremely eccentric. He had a habit of uh, welcoming guests in the nude. He liked to eat uh, onions raw, like, like apples. Um, a very eccentric guy a very, very devout Christian. We probably would call him an evangelical these days. Um, a completely devoted Zionist, which set him apart from almost all of his 
peers in the British uh, administration and the British Army. And most important of all, he was a military genius, and he created something called uh, the Special Night Squads, which were a mixed uh, British Jewish force that operated at night and really took the fight to went on the offensive against these Arab uh, armed bands. And really, this was the first sort of Jewish special forces, if you like. And it was really the seed of the future IDF leadership as well. This um, this unit, these special night squads, included men like Moshe Dayan and uh, Igal Alon, who would, of course, uh, become leaders of, of the IDF. Um, again, this idea of a diversity to advantage economically, Ben Gurion saw the revolt as a, as a source of as a tremendous uh, source of leverage to reach uh, to realize his long-standing goal of creating a self-sufficient Jewish economy that could employ itself and feed itself and house itself and defend itself without any help from the British or uh, the Arabs. Um, and the and the Brit the Arab boycott directly served that goal. This is the period in which Tel Aviv port opens, for example, because Jaffa port is striking in solidarity with the revolt. And uh, Ben Gurion petitions the British to uh, let him let them open a quote unquote Jewish port, uh, which they which they allow. And Ben Gurion is simply ecstatic. He refers to it as a second Balfour declaration. You know, he's now now we have an outlet to the world. Um, settlement. This is not a single settlement is abandoned during the Arab revolt, but but dozens of them Dozens of new ones spring up across the country. This is the period of uh, Wall and Tower, the Wall and Tower campaign. There was an old Ottoman law that if you put up a structure within 24 hours, if you put up a structure overnight, it was allowed to, to stay up. And so the Jews took full advantage of this and put up dozens of these uh, Wall and Tower fortresses in strategic uh, parts of the country. So in all of these ways, the Jews really sort of solidified their the, the springboard and the basis of the state that they would go on to create a decade later. And then when you look at the Arab side of the equation, it's really, it's really the mirror image of that. You know, the, the, the revolt to crush uh, Zionism in many ways crushes the Arabs themselves. Um, I haven't spoken that much about the British counterinsurgency uh, campaign, but it was extremely heavy handed, arguably even uh, brutal. Uh, thousands of Arabs were killed by British forces. This is when home demolitions began uh, on a major scale. Collective punishment was simply a part of the game in this uh, period. This is when um, administrative detention first begins. And a lot of the most controversial practices that the IDF uses today actually have their roots um, in this period and in emergency regulations, which are still on the books in, in Israeli law. Um, but I, I, I digress. The, the, the British um, killed thousands of, of Arabs in this counterinsurgency. They hanged a hundred more. Um, huge numbers of, of Arabs, Arab men were put, put into prison. Uh, the um, huge amounts of weapons were confiscated. The Arab economy was gutted by the boycott. The, the elites fled in large numbers to Beirut and Damascus and Cairo. This is another precursor to 1948. And so, uh, and there was, in, a, in addition to all that, there was just a, a convulsion of Arab infighting and score settling, um, and and families um, using this ostensibly national nationalist rebellion as cover to settle old scores. And the Mufti, who meanwhile had fled to Lebanon as a wanted man, was really pulling the strings of a lot of these more um, more damaging. Um, dynamics within Arab society of, of, of eliminating, shall we say, uh, traitors in his view or enemies of his, of his rather extreme and intransigent uh, line. So in all of these ways, the Arab social fabric is just completely torn. And I, and I argue in the book that in many ways, in 1939, once this revolt is finally sort of wrestled to the ground and, and and the Second World War begins, and the final reckoning between Jews and Arabs is kind of put on hold for the duration of the Second World War. I argue that um, that final reckoning between Jews and Arabs that we see in 47, 48 was really won by one side and lost by another nearly 10 years in advance. So I've, I've, um, I've hit the half hour mark here. I do want to leave a lot of time uh, for Q&A. So I think I'll... I'll um, I'll end with with this thought 
getting back back to the present and and what's happened over the last month um you know i think we we can't bring those people back who we lost on 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 10 7 but if it's 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 my feeling that if we can if if this pogrom and i think we have to call it that uh can lead can continue to lead to sort of the greater well, it can first off lead to the destruction or severe weakening of this evil uh, movement that calls itself Hamas. Uh, but if it can lead to the to the greater unity, the continued unity and, and solidarity of, of of the people of Israel, then I think we'll see some real rays of light uh, piercing through this through these very dark clouds. And um, and I think we'll be able to say even more more loudly and proudly those those three words which you all know, which are uh, Am Yisrael Chai. So I think I'll I'll um, I'll end on that note, and I'm very happy to take your questions. Thank you so much, Oren. Um, that that is not only moving but utterly relevant. I'm sort of stuck about halfway into the book, so don't tell me the rest. But um, I did have some questions about the book itself and how you got into the research, because it seems to me um, you've balanced Jewish, Arab, and British perspectives, and you get very personal um, talking about the backgrounds of each of the people killed in each of the raids, Jewish and Arab, who, you know, who did what. Um, how did you approach the research? And I know you, you've spoken to scholars in all three groups for this. Uh, did anybody have any reluctance to discuss it with you? Um, well, so one um, disadvantage, I suppose, about writing about events from 85 years ago is uh, there's basically no one left around to, to talk about them firsthand. Um, I was spending a lot of time with, uh, I spent a lot of time um, alone in, uh, in, in archives, um, you know, reading the, the thoughts of people who are no longer uh, on this earth. Um, but I did, I did do research in, in three languages, in, in, in English, Hebrew, and, and Arabic. Um, I did research on, on three continents, so in Israel, in the UK, of course, uh, and in the US. Um, and I really tried, I, I, I really tried to write as balanced a book as I could. You know, I'm, I'm a dual citizen of, of the US and Israel uh, and Poland, as it happens. A triple citizen. I'm not. I'm not Palestinian. Uh, you know, we all have our our, our perspectives and our and, and our biases, I suppose. But I really tried to let every side sort of make its best case um, uh, through its most eloquent eloquent spokespeople, um, and uh, and to give the reader that respect of 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 letting letting him or her uh, reach their own conclusions. Um, it. So yeah, it's um, you know sometimes it occurred to me that if I if I were still writing this book right now, I I might struggle a little bit to to show that same uh, balance and dispassion that I was aiming for because the events of the, these past few weeks have been so awful, um, so difficult, and because and they, because they've touched so many of us personally. Um, but I really that's I really tried um, to do that and and to tell and this may sound a little bit cliche, but I really wanted to tell this story through individuals and to reveal great historical events through individuals. I think it's, it's much, I think the reader just, just forms a much closer bond to, to individuals uh, when they can really get to know them. And so I went through a lot of personal correspondence. Um, sometimes I even felt like I was invading privacy a little bit because there are love letters in there and hate letters and, um, <laughs> uh sometimes love and hate letters in the same letter um but um but yeah that's that's really what i what i tried uh that's what i that's what i tried to do yeah yeah very very interesting i i know um you have you have one character you haven't named yet uh musa alami who was i guess cambridge educated and he was very close in some ways with jewish neighbors when he was young and then by the end of his time and by the end of the book, he's estranged, but he had personal conversations with Ben Gurion um, and a number of others, and he actually worked for a Jewish commissioner uh, in from the British side. So can you talk a little bit about him and what the paradoxes were for him? 
Yeah, people, uh, a lot of readers have really connected to this to this man of Musa Alami, and I'm and I'm really I'm really glad about that. I I really I I do choose a handful of figures on all three sides, so Jewish, Arab, and British, and and follow them throughout uh, the story. And one of my quote unquote one, yeah one of my Arab characters is is Musa Alami, and he's a really fascinating, complex, and compelling person. He's probably the first. Um, Palestinian Arab, to use the terminology of the time, uh, to attend Cambridge. He's a he's a brilliant man. He's a very well educated man. Um, he's a man who has real friendships among the British and among the Jews. One of whom is, as you mentioned, uh, David Ben Gurion, and they have a ser for for several years in the early and mid thirties. They meet regularly. Um, they meet regularly, sometimes at Alami's home in Jerusalem. Sometimes uh, there's a there's a point at which Ben Gurion recommends a doctor for Alami in Tel Aviv because Alami's health is always failing, and they have these very intimate conversations. And it's clear that they hold each other in in tremendous esteem, even while holding diametrically opposed political aspirations. Alami is is an Arab nationalist, full stop, uh, and yet he's willing to sit and talk and listen uh, to the to, to Jewish perspectives and even to try to reach some kind of modus vivendi. And they come tantalizingly close to some sort of understanding. Uh, but as tends to happen in that part of the world, for one reason or, not, or another, everything uh, fizzles out or, or, or goes down in flames. Uh, so, um, so yeah, Alami is a really, a really fascinating um character and I, I some of the some of my chosen figures are very will be very well known uh to readers even before they open the book you know winston churchill um david ben Gurion, uh the grand mufti but others like alami have have sort of faded into semi-obscurity and i was very happy to uh to shine a light on them once again very good um now you did a lot of work in the archives um some of them I've heard you say you have been open only maybe 10 years, like the Peel Commission one. Um, can you talk about some of the surprises you found, things that you didn't already know or, or weren't expecting? Probably the most, the, the one of the most fascinating things I, I, I found were the secret testimonies from the Peel Commission that I mentioned earlier. So uh, the Peel Commission, uh, they heard testimony from dozens of witnesses, uh, many, many Jews, and then um, ultimately some some leading Arabs as well and, and British administrators. And they published all of these transcripts um, along with the report. They published all of the public uh, sessions, but there were in addition, in parallel, there were all, there were dozens of secret sessions that were never meant to be published. In fact, the people testifying there were under the understanding that 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 these um, these these minutes, the transcripts would be burned. Um, but uh, a very forward thinking uh, secretary of this commission stowed away one or two copies and wrote hand wrote in the margins. Uh, these, these ought to be preserved because they will be of tremendous interest to uh, historians of Palestine and the Jewish people in the remote future. So the remote future is, is now and we are those historians and these testimonies remained classified for 80 years and were very quietly declassified in 2017 by uh, the British without any kind of fanfare. And there's, it's just so, it's so illuminating because everyone is speaking completely candidly on the assumption that no one will ever see their remarks. And so, for example, there's, there's a certain point, I don't wanna to give too much away, but there's a certain point at which the commission is wrapping up its work in Palestine and they really wanna, they want to be able to make a, a concrete proposal about what to do about this intractable problem. Intractable problem. And they start moving in the direction led by one particular commission commissioner, and they start leading towards this idea of a clean cut, a full, a full partition. And the idea comes together in like a page and a half where they where they, where they um, you know, the, this uh, they call in the, this irrigation advisor in the Palestine government and then they call in, uh, you know, a mid level official and they say, OK, do you think uh, do you think the Jews should have an army? Yes. OK, do you think? And they just very quickly, on about a page and a half of testimony, they create this solution, this proposal, which has had such resonance uh, and such an influence throughout uh, throughout history. So, um, 
so that was very fascinating and then one other thing was that i i discovered uh the testimony of the very first high commissioner for palestine whose name was herbert samuel and herbert samuel was a jew he was the first jew in the british cabinet and a zionist and uh he's brought in to 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 these peel secret testimonies and he's asked okay why did you appoint this man amin al husseini as mufti back in 1920 21 what were you thinking because you know now he's leading a revolt against us what 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 may lead, led you to do this uh and uh, again, I, I won't give too much away, but I did. I wrote an article for Times of Israel uh, recently about that Samuel's sort of defense, why he made this decision, which I think was is one of the most fateful in the history of the Arab-Israeli conflict. I think one of the huge. There are so many what ifs in this period, but one of the huge what ifs is what might have happened had someone else been vested with such tremendous power to be to be Grand Mufti. Um, so yeah, really really fascinating stuff and it's kind of mind-boggling that that documents crucial crucially important documents are still being declassified um just a few years ago amazing we have uh, an audience question um could you please comment on netanyahu's reaction to 107 that is leading to horrific consequences for gaza civilians where might that lead in terms of international support might this lead eventually to a political solution of a two-state solution so this this is the moment where I where I take refuge in the fact that my book is about the 1930s and not not the 2020s. Um, okay. But I, I will try to I, I I will I'll say this. Um, I think there's widespread um, dissatisfaction, resentment in Israel against this government for how for for what appears to be a clear lack of preparation that this was allowed to happen on their watch. Of course, there's a lot of responsibility that has to be borne by by the IDF as well. And I'm sure much more will come to light uh, once the inevitable commission of inquiry happens. Um, but there's a tremendous amount of, um, you know, I think Netanyahu's um, uh, popularity numbers are, are lower than they've ever, ever been. And I think I've even heard members of his own Likud party uttering criticism of him that we simply haven't heard before. Hmm. On the other hand, I think there's a feeling that Israel is at I mean, Israel is at war now. It's at it's 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 there were I'm sure many of you saw that there were 16 soldiers killed just over the last day or two. Um, and this is a period of, in addition to the the, the awful death toll that we that we've seen early uh, on ten seven, and um, so this is a period in which the country is really pulling together, as I mentioned, and I think the reckoning for Netanyahu will come a bit later, and then for this government will come will come later. Um, I would also say this: I don't think that at this moment of such tremendous pain in Israel, I think the immediate the immediate goal for most israelis right now is is just to regain a sense of security and safety i don't think i mean i used to work at haaretz newspaper which of course is very much on the left and i've noticed a real change in the tone of haaretz this is not to suggest that they've become very militaristic or something but the there's a I think the Israeli public right now will demand nothing less than um, a very forceful response against Hamas and to and to dramatically change the security situation um, in southern Israel and then the, and the rocket and the terrorism threat from Hamas. I think at the risk of offering a somewhat unsatisfying answer, I wouldn't expect any any kind of real move towards serious negotiations with the Palestinian Authority over the next uh, year or two. I think the, I think Israel is too traumatized. I think not just too traumatized, but so much needs to be. We don't know who's going to be running Gaza in a few weeks. We don't know if it's going to be Hamas. We don't know if it's going to be the Palestinian Authority. We don't know if Israel is going to reoccupy. So, um, you know, uh, at the risk of uh, getting out over my skis here, there's there's that saying from uh, Ecclesiastes, there's a time for war, uh, a time for peace. I think I think most Israelis feel that now is the time to regain, to, to really strike a, a powerful blow against Hamas. 
of course we have to care about what's happening in Gaza. I've, I've said in some of my, my recent talks, you know, even in these very painful times, for me personally, I think it would be, dare I say, un-Jewish to not care about the lives of, of people in Gaza, even when we're in pain. And whether we, I'm sorry for this very long-winded answer, but I'll try to wrap it up. I think we have to take Hamas casualty figures with a certain amount of skepticism. Hamas uh, has has a has a certain penchant for for lying, and yet it's 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 clear that what's happening in Gaza, the operation in Gaza, is a more wide ranging, powerful one than than we've ever seen. So um, it's a, it's a it's a very difficult time on on both sides of that fence, and I would not put my money on seeing negotiations anytime soon. I'm sorry to say. Yeah. I think that may cover uh, the next question I had. Do you see opportunities for Jews and Arabs to work together in the future? Uh, and what would that look like? So I'll, I'll try to answer more, not be as long winded. But I look, I think within Israel, I think there have been tremendous signs of Jewish Arab cooperation. Let's not forget. I saw an article today about um, the toll about the toll suffered by the Bedouin of Israel in uh, 21 Bedouin were killed in this attack, if I'm not mistaken, and quite a number, I think 16 were taken hostage. And this has barely been reported on. But, um, you know, it's, it's, things get a lot more complicated once you look within Israel proper and you see just how much interaction there is between Jews and Arabs on a daily basis. Um, and so, you know, there are certainly Arabs, uh, Arab citizens of Israel who have who have very much joined these grassroots efforts to kind of heal and rebuild and and supply and feed people in need uh, right now. So I don't think I think from the outside, it often it seems like just Jews on one side and Arabs on the other, Jews on one side, Israelis on one side, Palestinians on the other, on the other. Israel is a massively complex country and within the state of Israel uh jewish arab relations are are um are extremely complex and um and um and i think we have seen a lot of uh, a lot of positive trends uh, on that front as well yeah i did notice um in haaretz uh sometime last week jackie hori uh had an article about the pa and its response not really being effective at the moment but i do know that in prior years, uh, Netanyahu might be talking one way out loud, but also cooperating on, say, a desalination plant with the PA and with Jordan under the under the elbow, kind of, you know, under the table. Um, so, so there's a lot of complicated ins and outs about it. Um, I did want to ask, uh, did you talk with uh, Dr. Sari Nuseba for the book? Was he one of the scholars you interviewed? I met I met with him and he was yeah. very hospitable. He had me over at his home in East Jerusalem, but he said over and over, I'm not an expert on this period. Uh, you know, I'm happy to happy to chat, but um, uh, but I was able to find some archival documents that related to his grandfather, uh, Anwar Nosebe, who was a prominent Arab official in the British mandate. He was a judge. Um, and so I think he got a kick out of that. that I was able to to find uh, to, to to find some um, some comments on that and and some other relatives of his and what the British were thinking about about this this grandfather of his and that grandfather of his. So I think he got a yeah. kick out of that. But I actually, yeah, he was very clear that uh, he's not a historian of of this period, and so he was happy to have me. But it was just sort of a a friendly chat. Yeah, it's an interesting thing. I, I heard him on the New Yorker radio hour sometime this week, last week, oh, really? uh, talking about uh, Hamas and whether it's possible to um, completely eradicate them from, from Palestinian society and what would be the best solution for that. Um, I wanted to ask you on a slightly similar note, um, I heard that uh, you've got a, an Arabic translation uh, for for the ebook for this at least, um, and have you heard from anybody um, from Arab audiences about it yet or not? Yeah, I, mean, no, I noticed is... there was a blurb on the back that recommended it, but I didn't know. <laughs> uh, yeah, this um, believe it or not, the first uh, the first translation of the book has been in Arabic. It's the only one so far. Although 
again, believe it or not, a Korean translation is in the works. Um, I certainly hope there'll be a Hebrew translation at some point and you may and have Spanish to do it. and German. <laughs> and if anyone's listening, you know, <laughs> any other language. Um, but yeah, it's it was a it was a huge pleasant surprise when I was contacted. There's an NGO based in New York called Ideas Beyond Borders, and they they're really trying to sort of um, re reduce the knowledge gap in the Arab world uh, in terms of publishing, as it's it's well known that the Arab world is not is quite far behind other parts of the world in terms of the amount of, of books that it publishes. Uh, per year in in Arabic, and so they they look for good and illuminating uh, books, um, whether they're classics of of philosophy or whether they're history books that can shed some light, and they and they translate them uh, for free. So I they asked if they could if I could grant them the rights in Arabic. I said yes, please do. And um, but I haven't yet heard uh, I haven't yet heard any feedback. So it looks like people are downloading it uh, because people are leaving ratings. Uh, but uh, yeah, but um, yeah, that's that's been really, uh, really. It's been a lovely surprise to see to see uh, to see the book in Arabic. Yeah. Okay, and I'll ask one final question. Uh, what do you hope we in the West can take from your book, uh, applying it to current situation and maybe the future? Uh, Perhaps the idea that there there have there were other ways that this could have gone which suggests that there still could be other ways for it to go uh, we spoke earlier about about musa alami and his uh, conversations with ben gurion ben gurion had conversations with a with a man who i i follow quite a bit in the book named george antonius who's a real another sort of um, brilliant arab thinker and a real ideologue of arab nationalism and their talks go quite far, uh, perhaps surprisingly. Um, there's there are there were a number of prominent um, there were a number of prominent Arabs who accepted the partition plan, who accepted various um, various formula for 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 reaching some kind of modus vivendi with the Jews and on the Jewish side. You know, I didn't I didn't mention this talk, but there were there were dissident movements uh, opposed to Ben Gurion's leadership who um, who engaged. In, I, I think it has to be called engaged in, in Jewish terrorism, who who were quite maximalist in their views. And there was a real uh, there was a real internal debate and internal struggle within the Jewish Zionist community um in terms of what kind of movement do we want to be what kind of future do we want to have um how maximalist should we be in our positions so um all of this is to suggest things didn't have to go <laughs> didn't have to reach the impasse that they that they're that they appear to appear to be in now uh in which they perennially appear to be there were other ways that that this uh could have gone and I and I think um, I think that's an important lesson for the future that we don't have to be stuck in the same old uh, paradigms of, of conflict. I think I'm going to have to wrap the questions there. We're just about at eight o'clock. Thank you so much, Oren, for coming today and talking about the current situation as well as your book, Palestine, 1936, The Great Revolt and the Roots of the Middle East Conflict. Um, Oren's book, and I think I showed it before, uh, is available for purchase at all of our book festival events in person or wherever you get your books and he's been kind enough to sign some book plates so if you want one contact the jewish federation office and we'll send one to you uh, down in the chat box um, we have posted a link to the jewish federation's israel emergency fund we don't do this often but we're doing it now and also for i think for the american friends of the mogan david adam which is emergency services uh, like the red cross but ours. Um, so please join us this Saturday evening, November 4th at 7 p.m. at Temple Beth Israel in Pomona and on Zoom for the next Jewish Book Festival event. Helene Stepinski and Bonnie Siegler will present The American Way, A True Story of Nazi Escape, Superman, and Marilyn Monroe. And get started reading our One Book, One Community selection, A.J. Sidransky's Incident at San Miguel. And join us for some special event 
items uh, with the author on Sunday, November uh, 19th at 4 p.m. at Temple Sinai in Glendale, also on Zoom. Thank you again so much for joining us this evening. Uh, this is the Jewish Book Festival's 25th year. We are so honored, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Good night.